I'm so delighted today to have the opportunity to uh, have a conversation with my friend Scott Pulsifer, the president of Western Governors University. Uh, Western Governors, uh, as I was talking to Scott before, if you're in the higher ed world, you definitely know all about Western Governors University. But if you aren't so intimate to it, you might have no idea how transformational this institution has been over the last uh, nearly 30 years since it was started. Today, 150,000 students all online, really focused on providing opportunities for its students with a huge return on, on education. But Scott, welcome to Head on the Edge. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Michael. It's truly a pleasure to be with you. So I really wanna spend most of our time talking about what you're doing and where you're going, but I think it's good to have some perspective of where you've come from. Talk about the, the origin story and how this got going. Western Governors University, what's, what's the background behind this and how did it, how did it start? Yeah, it, uh, to me, this is actually quite fascinating, and hopefully it'll be so for your listeners as well. But uh, it is called Western Governors University because, in, in fact, the governors of 19 Western states provided both the concept that, was, that created the founding of WGU, but also they provided the seed capital, if you will, to, uh, to establish its initial founding. Uh, there were really two governors that were driving that, uh, the thinking behind it. Uh, that was Governor Mike Levitt out of Utah and Governor Roy Romer out of uh, out of Colorado. And uh, it, there were really two premises it to, to this fundamentally, which was one is there were many residents of these respective states that are not, were not being well served by their public institutions of higher education. As you might imagine, many of those individuals come from underserved or underrepresented backgrounds. They're rural populations. They're working learners. They're individuals of color. They come from communities that are, have not been historically served well by the traditional systems. The second thing that they were certainly intent on trying to solve for is how do you create a more expansive talent pipeline for their growing economies and their workforce? And so how do they increase that alignment that existed between post-secondary education pathways into the workforce that they needed? And so these governors really started uh, you know, developing, if you will, that core idea around how do you create a new private nonprofit institution that can also utilize two key things uh, at, the, at its original founding. We've kind of built on this much more than those two original key things, but one was Levitt simply going, this was 1996, mind you, hey, we think this internet thing is going to be big. What if we started from a tech-first mindset and an online-first mindset? How would you rethink the access and the delivery and the experience of learning and education utilizing the internet as your core foundation. The second piece of that came from Governor Romer, who uh, he often tells a story about how he was a pilot and that he's like, I don't really care where the individual learned to fly. I don't care necessarily how many hours. I really care about whether the individual is a competent pilot. And that was kind of this, uh, you know, that originated the thinking and the focus around competency-based education where it puts more emphasis on whether or not an individual demonstrates proficiency in the learning outcomes of a particular course or a program, and it lets the time vary. I think if, you, uh, if we talked about that more, you'd start to realize how important this was for these individuals that we were designed and built to actually serve working learners who already have so many uh, things that demand time and attention from them that trying to fit their education into their already busy lives. A competency-based approach was a pretty vital to our fundamental formation, and that allowed us to then kind of build this technology-enabled and competency-based uh, institution that, in fact, today is even larger than you introduced it. We are graduating nearly 50,000 individuals a year, and right now we have about 170,000 concurrent enrollment and full-time students, all degree-seeking, all full-time enrolled uh, as of right now. And so. You know, in our 27 years of operations now, I, I don't imagine that uh, that these original governors ever expected to be this impactful. I even have a thing on my wall behind me, Michael, that uh, gives us a daily update to the number of degrees that have been awarded, and that number is now uh, just under 355,000 since its founding. Absolutely incredible. So congratulations for what you've accomplished and just the incredible success of Western Governors. Talk about, and we're, I want to talk a lot more about the competency-based education and, and how that really works, but give, give your background. So you're a successful business person. You worked at Amazon, you were at Sterling, you had a couple successful startups, you got a Harvard MBA. What got you 
interested in Western Governors University and, and what was sort of the process that brought you in? Yeah, that was a combination of uh, some developing interest on my part of what I saw kind of leadership really meaning and how I thought about having an impact in the world and whether or not that which I was doing was going to improve the lives of those with whom I associated for the better. That generally as a model drew me a lot to startups. That was the, hey, you know, the collection of individuals that come together as a team to create a solution to a problem that they thought was big. And then how do you coalesce all of your effort? to driving you know, progress and success for those startups. It was something that uh, really bonded you to one another that I found much more impactful on a truly emotional and a human connection level more than pursuing money or anything else like that. So for me personally, I always wanted to, to know whether or not I was having an impact on the lives of those with whom I associated uh, as a colleague, as a friend, as a leader. And I had that natural inclination towards that type of impact. Now. Having said that, I really was fascinated by how technology was, as a tool was helping whole sectors rethink it themselves. How do we redesign retail? How do we redesign manufacturing and supply chains? And how do we redesign banking and payments? And that was much of my background previously, you know, really from, you know, early, early 2000, coming out of business school, joined my first startup, head of product, re, you know, kind of reinventing order management and retailing. And uh, that startup it was successfully acquired by Sterling Commerce. Then I had an opportunity to also work at Amazon, starting a business inside of them. Web Store, it was the equivalent, basically Shopify, if you imagine, leveraging all of the Amazon services to help uh, sellers be more effective in selling their solutions and products and services online. And incredible experience in really learning how to be customer obsessed, how to understand design of processes and practices so you can repeat something not just once, but thousands and millions of times. And so how do you really think about scaling? That was really beneficial. But then serendipity kind of took hold here. As I was leaving Amazon and joined another social commerce startup, uh, it actually brought us from Washington State, Seattle, down here to Utah, where uh, WGU is actually headquartered. And interestingly, Bob Mendenhall, my predecessor, and really the founding president of WGU, he, he led it for 17 years. They hired a, a search firm, executive search firm, who the lead partner actually had been trying to recruit me out of Amazon. And he just said, oh, that's interesting. I know this person who has a personal disposition towards the impact nature of WGU. I personally had also already relocated my family and ourselves to Utah. And I also had become more affiliated with my undergraduate alma mater, BYU, where I even started working in le guest lecturing and, and seminar series and was even going to start as an adjunct in 2016. But before this, you know, our, the, the executive recruiter basically said, hey, this may feel a little bit like a left turn, if you will, out of the technology space. But in reality, when you see what WG is doing, when you see its focus on student obsession, when you see its focus on trying to change lives for the better, when you see its leverage of technology to reinvent how we think about delivering and affording and doing everything in higher education, the learning, the instruction, the curriculum development, everything about it is technology enabled. This might be a really interesting fit for you, Scott. And so it took him two months, I think, to get me to sit down with Bob. A one hour lunch turned into a two and a half hour conversation. But Michael, I'll tell you this, is that the, I, as things progressed, uh, the board and, and Bob invited me to attend a commencement in February of 2016 down in Florida. And I got to spend the evening talking to these graduate alumni of WGU. I got to sit and watch the commencement. And there was one thing that just really impressed me, real, maybe two things. One is a, a pretty notable uh, dynamic that existed at this commencement, unlike a traditional one, which is there were probably as many children as there were parents. It was just fascinating to see kind of these, you know, uh, mid-30 individuals or even 40-year-old individuals or even older. We've had graduates as old as 80, where their whole, you know, like the impact of a, pursuing their education and attaining their degree was being seen by multi-generations. Like, this was just incredible to see this multi-generational impact of this attainment of this individual. But the impression I really walked away from was these individuals and the lives that they've led, the pursuit that they've has been a key part of their life in achieving these bachelor's and master's degrees, I left with the sense that the attainment of their degree actually mattered more to them than, than mine. In some way, the privileges that I had been afforded, that the education became part of my standard path, but it wasn't necessarily for all these individuals. 
And yet here they were making an incredible change in their lives and then seeing how that was going to have a multi-generational impact. And you probably know this data. We know that if someone actually completes their uh, degree, that their children are 10 times more likely to also go to college and achieve that degree. And that's the kind of impact I started seeing WGU is like, wow, this thing can be huge. It can have a huge impact. And that's really been the focus of WGU ever since our founding is that how do we change lives for the better by creating pathways to opportunity? How do we invest in reinventing education so it can remain the single biggest catalyst for people to change their lives for the better? And that ultimately drew me to WGU in a way that the board somehow thought it was uh, a wise idea to extend the offer to me to join. And I've been here nearly eight years and it's just been a thrill. Honestly, I've never thought that a professional pursuit could have such meaning and impact. So it's just been awesome. Well, you, you alluded to it. I want to get a little, a little bit more specific. Who, who your student population is? I mean, you, you know, what's their background, their, their, their ages, the, 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 what they come from, the, you know, the, the number one, the, the, the percentage that are the first time college students. And, you know, that would think be very, very. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, that's actually important to understand, broadly speaking, because we can often have uh, misperceptions about how higher ed is operating in the U.S. generally. It's like, oh, we may think it's really diverse community, but in reality, it's not as diverse as we might think. Is that many who are participating in post-secondary education have had parents who've gone and completed their degrees. They do come from higher income you know, segments or higher income quintiles of our population. WG's population, we were designed to serve those who have been underserved or underrepresented in post-secondary. And so 70% of our students are in one or more categories of such underserved or underrepresented populations. For example, about 13% are, have military or military families. About the same percent, or actually is, could be as high as 16, 18%, depending on the state, are from rural communities and don't have access to a campus or it's not within a 30-minute 30, 30 drive. There are individuals who are first-generation students. That's more than 40% of our students are first-generation uh, college-seeking students. About 40% now are students also of color. You know, so they come from underrepresented or historically underrepresented backgrounds. We also have populations that come from the low income. Over about 40% also are Pell-eligible students. And so you can start to see that this dynamic is a one thread, if you will, that I would probably connect across all of those is these are working individuals. They're working adults. They're over. The, they're from 16 years old to 80 year olds. Honestly, uh, our historical age demographic has been kind of in the mid 30s, uh, 35 to 37 has been our average age of our students. But frankly, Michael, in the last five years, our fastest growing age demographic has been the under 24 population. Uh, just to give you a sense of that, about six years ago, about 5% of our population then was under 24, but that percent is now 12 to 13% of our total student body of 170,000 are under the age of 24. We've also seen an increase in the percent that have had no prior college, where previously we were 97, 98% of our students had some prior college, but no credential. Now that number has probably declined to where we have about 7 to 10% are first-time college-going students. And so this just to me is an example of even with our non-traditional designs, meaning, you know, virtual online tech first competency based, you know, design for this personalized instruction that is starting to resonate with a much more diverse uh, student body today than even where WGU started. Uh, and it's a dynamic that we think is going to keep happening. The pandemic certainly catalyzed some of that. So that's uh, that's what you'll see and experience at WGU, but it will be very diverse. It's fun to kind of go to a commencement and hear about the youngest graduate, maybe 16 or 15. We've actually had an even ones lower, a 14-year-old graduated uh, one time, but we've had graduates be 80 years old too. Uh, and so that's a much different population of learners than or students than most campuses or institutions think of. Well, you, you talk about 350,000 alumni. And does that continue to grow and the experience that, you know, these these graduates have had with Western governors and the experience that, you know, companies have had in terms of employing them? My, get, my, my, my thesis would be that that continues to, to, to grow very quickly in terms of the, the broadening of, you know, who, who looks at Western governors as a great, great, great solution for them. Yeah, I think that's uh, right. And honestly, because we've designed it that way, meaning that we have put the student at the center of everything we do. We serve them as the primary beneficiary of everything that we do. 
And our key results even are emphasizing that. So our key results are simply about completion, that we want to increase the percentage of those who start that complete. And we want to ensure that having completed that, our second key result is that you actually achieve the opportunity and the return on the investment you made. And so we focus on the return for our graduates. And our third key metric or key result is equity in both access and attainment, that we certainly believe in the fundamental worth of every individual. We know that if given the opportunity, everyone has something big to contribute. And so we exist to expand that opportunity, to expand access to the educational pathways. We exist to personalize those journeys, to make them more traversable by every individual, regardless of your background, regardless of what you come with, regardless of your learning style. We are trying to adapt to you so that it feels like the whole of the university was designed exclusively for you. And when we do that, it increases the probability that every individual can complete. And if you complete, then it's going to be relevant to the jobs and opportunities you want to pursue. And so we measure that. And I'll just give you one, uh, you and your listeners, one interesting stat we have, which is we have an NPS among our graduates of 74. We know that our graduates are incredibly satisfied that they're more than twice as likely to say it's worth the cost. They're more than twice as likely to say they had faculty that encouraged their dreams and aspirations. Their employers are really satisfied with their readiness. Our graduates feel like they've been prepared for their job. And when that happens, guess what? That large alumni and growing large alumni base, they refer a lot of friends and colleagues. Uh, and so it definitely reduces our cost of serving new students. It allows us to actually manage a flywheel, if you will, of, of impact. Yeah, I was just going to say that flywheel becomes very, very powerful. And just a couple of different data points that I complement what you just said. This mismatch of when you talk about the student centric approach that you have where 92% of students say what they're really going to, the primary reason for get, going to higher, you know, get a, go to college is to, to get a job, and yet 15% of the faculty says they think that's what the priority is. I mean, it's just completely yeah. out of bounds. Obviously, that's not the, the case with you. The second is this increasing amount of dissatisfaction that college, you know, is it wasn't worth their time and money. And, you know, 10 years ago, most people, most graduates says it, said it was. Today, most say it wasn't. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's really, really um, the fact that you're bucking the, the, the trend with the satisfaction and then what you're addressing, which just makes sense with, with the, I've never heard of an NPS in higher education of above 70. So congratulations. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty spectacular. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's interesting just to, you know, just to consider modeling what an institution might look like if you first and foremost say our primary value proposition is to help people change their lives for the better. And the way that happens is, that they're prepared for the opportunity they want to pursue. What that ultimately means is that you start to recognize that education is actually a means to an end. That's why we talk about pathways. That it's not enough to acquire knowledge, skill, and ability. It's what you actually do with that knowledge, skill, and ability and what it even gives you the option to do. And so we certainly have designed things to say, this is actually a pathway to what you want to do. And so we even think about that with prospective students. What is it that you want to do? What kind of vocational identity do you have? How do you, how do you think about having an impact in the world? All right, given that, which program or pathway is the right one for you? But it's all designed with that outcome being the primary value proposition of what we're trying to accomplish for our students. And we are therefore fundamentally a teaching institution. You know, we, we leverage even all the knowledge and content and the expertise that's been provided by so many others Rather than us focusing on creating that, we're trying to figure out how do we really help every individual master that content and demonstrate the proficiency so they can actually complete and then pursue and acquire that opportunity that they wanted to in the first place. And it is an interesting notion that you would say if you were truly student obsessed and they're telling you that I'm doing this so I can get a job, like, okay, so what are we doing so that you can actually get the job that you came here and you believe that was the promise in the first place. 100%. And that still says little of the employers. The employers are also looking at these colleges and their degree seekers and their rising grads and saying, this is one of the biggest talent pools that we're going to, to acquire the talent that we need to fill the roles and responsibilities of those roles in the future. And if they're misaligned, then the employers as a secondary customer or a stakeholder, their needs aren't being served either. And so I think we're trying to make sure that that connection between education and work is always existing. So talk about, well, first of all, as it relates to that student-centric piece, I mean, do you, how, how do you use coaches or advisors to interact with students? And how do you think about AI 
as a tool, having your kind of personal uh, advisor uh, in the future? I mean, how do you think about that and how are you utilizing that today? Yeah, the uh, as you might imagine, it's like we see AI as an awesome technology tool that's going to make so much of the things we're designing even better and more effective. But technology is incredible because it can both be direct self-service, if you will, for a student, but it's also enabling the, our faculty, our program mentors, and our course instructors, evaluators, to also provide the timely, relevant service and interventions that they need to provide for a student. So it allows both things to happen, that how does technology help an individual do things on their own, progress on their own, get the kind of insights that they need. And AI starts to now uh, compound that. It's truly gonna be exponential because now AI can be a co-pilot for the student, but AI can also provide the co-pilot capabilities for our mentors and for our course instructors. Now, to, for that to happen is it's not just about the large language models and the core kind of curriculum content, et cetera, that can provide the timely relevant information that's needed so that the individual student can master modular content element of a particular course. But it's also all the data that we're providing into that tool, into the AI machine, the machine learning of the, that powers the AI because we have instrumented the entire end-to-end -end student journey. Like we're observing how are different students engaging with the content? What areas do they show you know, friction with or struggles with? Where are they accelerating? What were their you know, uh, areas of improvement around assessments and what are we learning from that? How are they interacting with their mentors and course instructors? We have a very, very large data set that we can feed back into the machine learning so that it now is providing us a better, more you know, personalized or individualized journey to say, all right, this is now shaping how our mentors and course instructors are engaging with the student, a single student. And a, how do I have to help you right now in the circumstance that you're in with the content you're trying to master, et cetera. And not doing that as some standard I think, thing for the other hundred students the mentor may be supporting. It's like, oh no, it's just about you individually. And so we see how AI is going to dramatically increase the personalization or the individualization of the learning journey. And when you do that, we would expect a, you know, a significant step function increase in overall progress, pace, persistence, and ultimately completion. And that to us is very, very promising. And, but we do benefit from the fact that we have a very large data set. So it's awesome to kind of work with a, a technology, you know, tech first kind of approach to things that say, all of these interactions are inputs to how we design learning. So like I said I was going to get back to the competency-based learning. Um, what, what, talk a little bit more about how that works and the effectiveness you see from it. I think the story about Roy Romer and the airline pilots were really good you know, yeah. an, an analogy to, to think about. But how does that actually work and what kind of success do you see from that? Yeah, and uh, you know, not being a you know PhD or terminally degreed individual myself, I I, I often like to highlight that this is from that perspective. But CB itself is not really a pedagogy; it's not an instructional model, because we actually accept that there's going to be multiple instructional models that are inputs. There are things that are helping an individual actually develop the mastery or the proficiency that's needed, so that in fact you can complete that course or that module, et cetera. What we basically said is, well, we have many different pedagogical models. They can be more academic in nature, meaning it's content, it's actually tutoring, it's engagement with a subject matter expert, but there's experiential learning that's practicum related that you know this is about application of that learning, learning the models of it, et cetera. There's peer-based engagement and self kind of you know, learning that can happen. Like all those different models exist, and those are inputs to whether or not an individual has mastered something. So for us, competency-based education means you really have to be very clear about what are the learning outcomes that you expect to be demonstrated. Second, do those learning outcomes match to the skills that are needed in the jobs and the work that you're going to be doing? Third is, what's the level of proficiency that you have to demonstrate to ensure that your learning or your knowledge, skill, and ability that's that is consistent with the standard that's expected for in terms of in terms of what's needed in that particular field. We are not new to this. Any licensure area in the workforce are competency based. If you're going to be a CPA, if you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a nurse, if you're a teacher, like it, there's so many licensure standards, and they're even increasing in other fields like certifications in cybersecurity or computer science, etc. 
they're all competency based. So our model said, well, if you're really clear about the learning outcomes and those learning outcomes are relevant and you know the proficiency standards that are needed, you have to design the assessment so that you can, in fact, fairly and consistency, consistently ensure that every student is demonstrating that proficiency. But once you demonstrate that proficiency, you can progress to the next course. You don't have to wait till the end of a term to take your exams. You don't have to go at a certain pace. You don't have to wait for your lecturer to give you the content. You can go at the pace that's right for you. And whenever you pass the assessment and demonstrate your proficiency, you progress. And so what we find as a result too, the students are benefiting because they're leveraging the learning they may have acquired through a lot of different things. They're leveraging dispositions they may have for some subjects or another. And they focus differently depending upon what, uh, what level gap exists between where they are and the mastery they need. So what is a net result of that also happens? Our bachelor's graduates are finishing on average in two and a half years instead of four, really five years is what average graduates are taking. You know, they're doing now that as a cost less than $20,000. You know, they're also being rated by their employers and themselves as being much more ready and prepared for the jobs that they're doing. And so this is the kind of outcomes that uh, were well contemplated and designed when competency-based was the approach that we were well, clearly it's working, um, and and what you're you know what you've articulated in terms of the key fundamentals of why it's working make all the sense. And, and you talk about the student centric, but you also talk about the employer, and it obviously you know kind of is implied. But talk, what what do the employers tell you they're looking for, and why do they like hiring students that come out of Western Governors University? Yeah, the, uh, at a macro level, you'll see that we don't have 200 degree programs. We have about 65 or 70 degree programs. We're also expanding the types of credentials we have to have sub-degree credentials, degrees, post-degree credentials. But what we really do is every time we're designing and developing a program, we're leveraging kind of macro data from the likes of Lightcast and others to give us good sense as to where are key skills that are going to be needed in future workforce areas. But then we have advisory councils that include employers, academics, et cetera, to really ensure that we're designing not just course outcomes, but the whole scaffold of those courses into a program that say this, the outcome of this program are going to have the skills and knowledge and ability that are directly relevant to these jobs that are increasing in need. A good example of that for us would be like a bachelor's in health services coordination in, in the medical field. It's like where the service being provided to patients is now traversing home, doctor's office, you know, health center, whatever it may be. And so that health services coordination, taking more of a value-based approach to patient care, is a model that needed different skill sets that, were being, that weren't existing in the traditional degree programs in healthcare management or something else like that. We do the same in cybersecurity. We do the same in computer science or in teacher preparation, et cetera. And so we're always making sure that that uh, industry and the workforce and the employer advisory is directly impacting how we're designing for the uh, learning outcomes. Now, the other uh, benefit is that because we have this master curriculum model where everyone has to demonstrate proficiency against the same thing, we're iterating on that on those learning outcomes in a much shorter life cycle than traditional higher ed. You know, you can turn over the whole program that may exist within a technology field in three years. You know, the, the, the whole outcomes are different because the shelf life of those skills is much shorter in certain fields. And so as a result, our employers are regularly coming back to WGU. 98% of them are hiring WGU graduates again because they realize that competency-based approach means that they've been certified as proficient. Last thing I'll give you, Michael, that was pretty brilliant when Bob and others designed this is that we actually embed industry certifications into the assessment traverse of programs as well. So if you're completing certain programs uh, in fields in health, in technology, you're coming out already with industry accepted certifications. And so you, the, the employers already know that, yeah, you also have this nice certification or you have this, you know, this certification, project management, whatever it may be to say, oh, not only do you have your degree, but you have these specific industry credentials that are highly valued by the employers in that sector. So you, and this is, we're wrapping up, just a couple more questions for you. You know, you talk about how fast things are changing. Are you seeing much of, uh, you know, the kind of lifelong learning of students that have graduated, you know, from, from WGU and coming back and, 
you know, getting a new certification or getting, you know, taking ongoing education from you? Is that, is that a pattern that you're seeing pretty, pretty consistently? I think we certainly believe that there, the modularization of learning is certainly occurring, that there is going to be uh, the unbundling, if you will, of a traditional degree into packaging that can be more timely and relevant to the opportunities. But we don't think that is supplanting a degree. We think it's just in addition to a degree. Um, and so we certainly see two things happening. One is our own students are certainly returning. As much as 15% of our bachelor's graduates are returning for the master's graduates. But what we also see is employers engaging with us on, uh, call them nano degrees or call them micro credentials, whichever you want to call them. But they're also working with us to design those that there are more, they're shorter form, shorter duration, but they're very relevant to specific jobs that are needed in the workforce. And that's particularly true if you're working with a large scale employer that may be out there that says, I have a thousand of these positions alone, they're unfilled, and I need to upskill my existing talent, but I need a competency-based, certified, you know, assessment-driven approach to ensuring that all those employees actually have the skills they're needed in, in, for that particular job. And so we see those dynamics already occurring. We, we, I, you know, I generally would say that, you know, AI and technology is going to accelerate the pace of change within curriculum design, content development, learning, and instruction. Second key thing is the modularization of credentialing is going to also accelerate because the shelf life of skills is certainly going to keep shortening. And uh, when you're thinking about enabling a workforce, there are more working adults than there are rising, you know, new first time you know, college graduates. And so you need to be thinking about how you're upskilling or reskilling this uh, you know, mid-career working adult and they aren't going to go back and get a bachelor's degree. The third thing we certainly uh, believe that is going to continue to happen is that the online and technology enabled learning environment is going to accelerate. We've already seen that in the math where I think the in-person exclusive percent of total enrollment is now the smallest percent. There's more in hybrid and online, ex exclusively online. And so we think that's a good thing. Why it dramatically democratizes access. It makes education so much more accessible. And when all the technology enablement exists behind that, you're also personalizing learning in a way that you can't in a classroom the same, to the same effect. Well, you have great passion for what you're doing, but just the last comment, what are you most excited about? As you think about what, what's going on either today or what you think the, the potential in the future is, what, what is the thing that you just like, okay, this could be transformational? For us, I think the thing that I'm personally most excited about is uh, creating a system of equity in education. Yeah, like the thing that I think is the mic drop moment in higher education is when we can show that regardless of your background, regardless, regardless of your pathway to the point of post-secondary education, regardless of your income level, your race, ethnicity, gender, whatever it may be, that in fact, we anchor on the inherent worth and that you know, incredible talent that exists everywhere. And we've actually shown that with the leverage of technology, with new instructional models, with different faculty approaches and everything else that says, we figured out how to make it possible for every individual to develop the competency and the skill and knowledge and ability that they need to change their lives for the better. Like that is one of those things where it says, when we can eliminate those attainment gaps across all those different backgrounds, when we can demonstrate that the learning acquired is directly relevant to the opportunity, so you don't have underemployed grad, you know, degree holders, you don't have overpaid, you know, a degree inflationary uh, every other area, that you have a great mechanism by which individuals are compassed into the opportunity. That, to me, is the most encouraging thing, and I think we're just beginning to see that role. I mean, I think we're just even at WGU is like. We're already seeing of how we are eliminating attainment gaps across these different backgrounds. And to me, that is when you take privilege out of the system, you take this you know, delusion of merit out of the system, meaning the idea that somehow someone performing a certain way on a test, et cetera, means that they have more talent than another. We just don't believe that. We think, in fact, everyone is top talent. And we start focusing on how do you help every individual actually demonstrate that talent. So if given the opportunity, they're contributing in immense ways, we start to realize that we can actually tap into talent that has been hidden or unseen for decades, if not generations. And that thing, that to me is the most encouraging thing happening right now in higher education. And to just fast, you know, if we flash forward one generation, that to me seems incredible because we'll 
we won't be thinking about exclusivity or selectivity. We're thinking about, oh no, we figured out a way to basically better everyone's lives. We figured out a way for them to actually pursue pathways and careers that are right for them. We figured out how to actually have a complement of gifts and talent in a way that today we have more comparative mechanisms, et cetera. That, that to me is the more encouraging thing that's happening because education next to faith is the single greatest catalyst for people to change their lives for the better. And it seems to me like we'd want to make that available to everyone we possibly can. That is the kind of future that I think is happening. And we're just at the beginning of it. Amen. Scott, that was off the charts. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights. Um, truly, truly um, inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you for, let, for letting me share it. Thank you for having me with you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Awesome.